Welcome to the Exit Rich Podcast, where the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing companies, Michelle Seiler Tucker, is dedicated to helping you find the path to retire rich and move on to your next adventure by exiting your business for the desired dream price you deserve. Get ready to exit rich with your host, Michelle Seiler Tucker. So I'm here with David Meltzer, my very good friend. So excited to have you on, David. Such a pleasure to be here. You know, every once in a while I meet someone and instantly I was like, this is one of my new best friends. We share so many friends in common. It's no doubt that I was going to fall in love with you immediately. Oh, that's sweet. Ditto. I'll make sure I get your Christmas present in the mail quickly. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> We're going to play your sizzle roll right now so everybody can learn how great you are like I know how great you are. Dave Meltzer, I, that's from the Unstoppable Foundation. I'm the chairman of the Unstoppable Foundation. And the highlight of, of my life was building two community centers in Africa. And now we have a high school, a university. We have impacted millions of people. And uh, I have gone from being in technology that I ran the world's first smartphone division uh, at Samsung to uh, CEO of Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment. Most people know Lee from the movie Jerry Maguire. So a lot of these scenes are from, that was Carousel. I'm the Goodwill Ambassador to Carousel. I speak around the world. I have four books. Uh, I have the two TV shows. One's called Elevator Pitch in season six, which I executive produce now and with Entrepreneur Magazine. And then I have a brand new show airing on Bloomberg called The Two Minute Drill, January 8th and Amazon Prime Video. Uh, these are once again, more uh, different things I do around the, the world, uh, speak, I, executive coach, uh, but everything I do has a charitable or purpose or cause tied to it. My main mission in life is to empower over a billion people to be happy. And uh, I've learned many lessons along the way to do that. I'm sure not as exciting as the music. I, you guys would be crying by now when you watch this uh, sizzle reel. So <laughs> reach out to me. I'll send it to you, david at dmeltzer.com. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm not sure what I missed, but there's, I don't know. They have tons of awards and accolades that <laughs> I've learned radical humility. I was Variety Magazine Sports Humanitarian of the Year, Ellis Island Medal of Honor winner, some of the great honors that uh, I've been blessed to receive. And here we go. I think it's coming to the end, maybe. And I'm just excited to be here to share my story, which is not one filled with uh, all successes. Let me just tell you that. All right, so maybe. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. I can't, I'm surprised that the sound wasn't working, but that's okay. You know, as entrepreneurs, we have to pivot, right? Exactly. I want to make God laugh, come up with a well developed plan. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here, David. I, I think oh, it's probably easier instead of asking you what you have done, asking you what you haven't done. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> oh, that's how I live my life. First of all, I wanted to thank you for interviewing me on your podcast and um, giving us a glowing testimonial for my new book, Exit Rich. You're just an amazing person. And I had, I told the crew, I'm like, I got to get on her show. I just want to talk again because your insight, experience, situational knowledge and heart, soul are aligned with mine, Michelle. And just, I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you. And I'm a huge fan of yours. So tell, tell, uh, tell our listeners, how did you get started? I mean, obviously, you've been extremely successful. And yeah. you know, other people are, are wanting to be successful, wanting to emulate other people's success. What got you started? What were you like as a little boy? And how did you become so successful as you are today? You know, it was about my relationship with money. So my mom, I had a single mom. I was five years old. My dad left. We had six kids, five boys and a girl. And my mom was very focused on education. I always joke around, the fetus wasn't fully developed till after graduate school. She had a great saying, doctor, lawyer, or failure. And all my siblings adhered to the, uh, what I call the black belt that she was. She was a third degree black belt in the martial arts uh, of Jewish guilt. And so they, they all were guilted <laughs> into being <laughs> doctors. I, I just wanted, literally, I love my mom so much. She uh, worked two jobs. She was a second grade teacher. She would pack our dinners in a paper bag and then she'd fill up turnstiles with greeting cards at the convenience stores just so we could eat and, you know, talk about a, a role model. What, what an unbelievable mom. In fact, I would sit in the back of the car. My dad was my hero because I didn't understand about 
deadbeat dads in the 70s, I would ask my mom why she couldn't be more like my dad. Oh, Meanwhile, my, my dad God. was, he was never paying for anything. And my poor mom, she just stayed quiet and humble and had a great impact on me because I just wanted to be rich as a little boy. Uh, I lived in a world of not enough. I thought I was a victim. I couldn't understand why everybody else had nice things and cars and dads and, you know, could, you know, eat out uh, different things that I just didn't have the luxury of doing. You know, great night out for me was my mom would buy two large French fries at McDonald's and pour them into a bowl, a bowl for six kids to share. And I eat around the world now at the most exquisite, you know, Michelin star restaurants. And I still think to myself how much more exciting it was to get those French fries. Uh, you know, I tell you, I eat around the world too at some of the best restaurants, but I love McDonald's French fries. <laughs> well, you were. I don't think I'll I would want to split them with five other kids. <laughs> right, I'm like Warren Buffett. I'll, I'll still stop into McDonald's. It's not every day like he does. Uh, but I had a relationship money that I wanted to be rich because I wanted to buy my mom a house and a car. In fact, at five years old, I told my mom, "You'll like this." I said, "I'm going to be a millionaire someday, mom." And I'm going to buy you a house and a car and never have to work again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I lost a million dollars in one day once and I laughed at my wife. I'm like, do you know what? When I was five, I told my, my mom that I'd retire on this much money and buy her a house and a car. I go, things have changed. Um, anyway, I uh, really pursued money. Now, the advantage for those people out there, I, I, there's a disadvantage and advantage of being that money is your ends, that money buys happiness and love. And I really did. I have to be honest, as a young uh, person and a young man, even as a multimillionaire in my 20s, mm -hmm. I believed everything reaffirmed money bought love and happiness. But the advantage to that is if you put money as your goal, as your end, then you keep your options open at all times. So my siblings were very well trained and educated. They stuck and adhered to my mom's vision of doctor, lawyer, failure. All went to the Ivy Leagues, all graduated summa cum laude. But me, I was, you know, always keeping my options open. I'd take any job that paid, you know, whatever paid more. I, I literally, my second year in law school prayed to God. I only wanted to be a lawyer because I wanted to be rich. It had nothing to do with the law. I just, I was an oil and gas litigator, which was the highest paid job in law. So I sat on the bed. I prayed to God. I said, God, because the recession was hitting. And I said, if you give me enough money to buy my mom a house and a car and pay off my law loans, no more retirement. I said, if you can give me that, I will shovel shit with my hands six days a week, 12 hours a day with gratitude. That's where my perspective was. And lo and behold, out of uh, law school, I did get an oil and gas legal job, but I also got offered a job to sell uh, legal research on the internet in 1992. So you're probably a little bit younger than me, but remember what the internet was like in 1992. It was not what it is today. My mom freaked out. My mom literally told me, don't I dare not be a real lawyer. The internet was a fad. I was going to lose all my money <laughs> working in the internet. <laughs> Nine months later, though, because I kept my options open, I was a millionaire. I bought my mom a house and a car, but I couldn't retire. There wasn't enough there left. Uh, <laughs> it was now the 90s, not the 70s. So, so it took uh, you nine years to get to the place where you could buy her a home and a car. Nine months. Nine months. Oh, nine, out of months. Law nine months. Nine I months. You said nine yeah. months. Wow. Oh, no. You, yeah. Do nine you think months. that was because of law of attraction, intention and no. um, and keeping your options open? Yeah, I do. I, I believe in what I learned looking backwards is what I paid attention to and gave my intention to created the coincidences in my life. And I still right. believe that. I call it the mathematical equation of luck. Uh, but, you know, even more coincidence, two years after I started my job, my company sold for $3.4 billion to Thomson Reuters, which set me off into a different trajectory. I then went up to the Silicon Valley, learned my superpower of raising money in the Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road, Sequoia, Amarindo, Texas Pacific. I raised hundreds of millions of dollars for a middleware company in the wireless space, which then attracted Samsung to hire me mm -hmm. to be the CEO of their first phone division. Uh, and I was just in my, I just turned 30. Uh, so I was very young. I was a multimillionaire. But everything until that point reaffirmed money buys love and happiness. But the truth was I didn't realize how lonely, sad, and empty I was because money was my ends and there's always more money. And so I went through a transformation in my 30s uh, that really changed my perspective of, I went from living in a world of not enough to living in the world of just enough for me. I always say I was buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't even like. 
and that had to change. <laughs> so wow. that did. And I, uh, you know, I think three things, you know, after Samsung, I was offered a job. I met Lee Steinberg. Samsung uh, was going towards not the convergence devices, which soon became the smartphones later in the 2000s. Uh, but there was really no executive role. Uh, my job was to raise money and to be a sales type of CEO. They needed, they were the second largest manufacturer of phones now. They needed a real CEO. So they wanted me to take a EVP of sales job. And my ego, I was a CEO in my mind. And I met Lee Steinberg, the famous, famous sports agent. And 48 hours after I met him, he offered me the CEO job of that sports agency. And so that was an easy transition to take my dream job uh, and get into sports. And ever since uh, Warren Moon, the Hall of Fame quarterback, and I were partners at Lee's, 11 years ago, we spun off a sports and marketing and media company. In the last four years, I've spent building my own brand uh, with coaching, speaking, books, TV shows, movies, all the great things that I'm able to do, but they're all for one purpose. I'm looking for a thousand people like you, Michelle, that I know will empower a thousand people to empower a thousand people to be happy. So over a billion people on earth, a collective consciousness of happiness, and I'm using all this content, all the access that I have in order to effectuate that. Wow, that's incredible. You are just, <laughs> you're amazing. You're on fire. So <laughs> how was it working at Steinberg? I, I think that would be very exciting. To work you know, it was, except for I had one issue uh, kind of early on, and that uh, was I was spiraling emotionally. Lee was an alcoholic. He wasn't admitting it to people. He has ever since. You know, he's ever since Warren and I spun off, he, uh, you know, has been sober for over 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. But when I was there, I had to hide so much. But the truth was, I was having my own difficulties. And I ended up going bankrupt. I lost over $100 million. And to tell him, I thought for sure I'd lose my job because he had really hired me because of my Midas image to recruit athletes that not only with Lee's Jerry Maguire reputation, but now the biggest concern for parents were my son losing everything. 75% of the players were losing all their money. So I was the Midas that said, look, this guy is so successful financially. He's going to take care of making sure that the money made is grown and, and maintained. And meanwhile, I go bankrupt. So I lose, <laughs> I lose that. I thought he was going to fire me, but he didn't. But here's even worse. People ask me all the time, you know, what was the hardest, lowest part? Like I said, my, my bottom had a basement because think about how low this is. I had to go tell my mom, Mrs. Dr. Lawyer of Failure, my biggest fear in life was to lose everything. I had to tell her that I lost everything, including her home, which was the only reason I wanted to be rich because I was dumb enough. I never took my mom's house out of my name because I bought it for her when I was 24 years old. I never took it out of my name. And so I had to go to my mom and not only tell her that I was a complete failure, but that she had to move. <laughs> and that's when I truly changed my life because my mom, without blinking, looked at me and asked if I was okay. She asked if I needed any money. She showed me what she meant my whole life, that I didn't get it, that I was lost. No matter what I bought, she would always say, David, money doesn't buy you love or happiness. Mm -hmm. It allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right <laughs> team, if, if you shop for the right things, you'll be happy, honey. You're shopping for the wrong things. You're shopping for the wrong things. You need to be unconditional. And uh, she displayed that to me uh, that day. And it set me on a different journey. Uh, one where I sit on the Transformational Leadership Council, I meditate, uh, and I've made back everything in a different direction because I don't live in a world of not enough where I'm a victim, where everything happens to me. I don't look in a world of just enough buying things I don't need or different things I don't need to impress people I don't like. I live in an abundant universe of everything, more than enough of everything, everything mm -hmm. for everyone, and nothing comes to me or for me. It comes through me for others. I went from nowhere to now here to nowhere to give my life away. That's my journey is to give my life away. And receiving is very important because I can't give what I don't receive. So I want to give as much away as I can. That's what inspires me to make money, help people and have fun. Wow. Everybody comment right now. We love David Meltzer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you live in a world of, you know, being a victim and not enough, I think that's what, you know, it's law of attraction, right? You lost everything. Do you think it's because you were leaving and you were living in that road of not enough and victim mentality and that's why you lost everything? I think exactly. I think what I've learned and I love James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. He talks about voting 
for what you want. And what happened was I was always voting for what was missing in my life. I was voting for what I did want out of fear and ego-based consciousness. And I got exactly what I was afraid of. And once yeah, exactly. I shifted that paradigm and I only vote for what I, I, I don't, I used to also vote for what other, the biggest danger is I'm an empathetic. I, I love people. I love to please people. I, I love to give. I, I didn't like to receive. And it was very difficult for me to learn that I needed to be worthy of everything that I received, that I needed to not vote for what other people wanted either. I needed to vote for what I wanted. You know, just because someone loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. And he's like my mom <laughs> telling me the internet's a fad. Well, I was voting for everything but what I wanted. Now today I take inventory of my values every day and vote for what I want. And I get what I want so it can come through me, not to me or for me, through me for others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I'm sure you have a mentor. I'm sure that you get advice from experts as well. Help we have the same way. mentor, I think. Sharon Lecter is one of my mentors. Yeah, and- <laughs> I love Sharon <Schindler. laughs> Yeah, I have three, three mentors at all time in my life, people that sit in the situation that I want to be in. So I have a sleep mentor because sleep for me is such an essential part of my life now. I have an unwinding routine and my sleep mentor. I need mentor a sleep is- mentor. I need a sleep mentor. She's the best. <laughs> she, she was the Washington National sleep mentor. She coached the, the national baseball team to four road victories during the World Series. And they actually gave her a World Series ring, which I told her, Dr. Mita Singh is her name. I said, Dr. Mita, how the heck did you get a World Series ring before me? That just shows you (laughs) what you can manifest in the universe. You get it. I don't. Wow, that's incredible. That's so. So when you were working with Steinberg, though, I just want to go back real quick. When you were working with Steinberg, how did you how did you go bankrupt? I mean, did you have another business on the side when you were working with Steinberg? Yeah. So what w- I had many investments and what happened was I was heavily into real estate development. I built that practice over 24 years after gotcha. buying my mama house. I continued. So I owned a golf course that ended up being uh, the eighth best golf course in the nation. It's called popular Grove. And we had $120 million valuation uh, on the golf course in 2006, 2000 acres building hotels and resort and, and uh, houses. I also owned 33 homes, condo conversions, a ski mountain. Uh, And what happened was I got into a lawsuit and I let my ego get in my way. A neighbor had sold me a condo conversion and I tried to prove myself right instead of, and I went through my liquidity thinking, well, I'll just borrow against some of my properties. Needless to say, I had no mentorship. I never asked for help. So when I went to my private bank and I said, Hey, I need 5 million, you know, I, I need a line. And they said, no. I said, whoa, 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 what do you mean no? I got like $40 million of equity. You're not going to give me five? They're like, no, the bank's having trouble. The economy's going down. We're not sure those properties are going to be worth that a year from now. Go somewhere else. And in my mind, that was never even a possibility that they wouldn't give me a line of credit. I had perfect credit. I had a whole bunch of secured interest and, you know, 2008. So I was not liquid. And when you own that much stuff, and you can't find liquidity, and then you start searching for hard money and high interest rate money, and you get desperate, and everyone else gets desperate, it turned into a complete secular nightmare. But needless to say, greatest lesson, I, I told the guy that I got in a lawsuit with, I went up to him, and I shook his hand years later, it took me years to get to this point, but I shook his hand at a tailgate, I said, I just want to thank you, without you, my life would not be this wonderful. And he thought I was going to punch him in the face. He was so scared when I walked up to him. And I was truly, sincerely, I know that I wouldn't be where I'm at, but for that happening. And I had my lessons to learn because I've learned pain is not a stop sign in Dave Meltzer's life. It's a turn signal. It's an indicator. I have lessons to learn, better place to go, better situation to be in. I am a lesson seeker. And I believe suffering is the process of learning lessons. So I don't mind suffering. I also know this. People don't mind hard but they're afraid of long and they don't right. look long. They don't plan long and they don't work long. And I'm not just talking long hours. I'm talking long perception, right. compound interest, exponential yeah. growth, acceleration. I was born with the capability to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. I'm born a long thinker, which is a great quantum memory to have because I see things in 20 year increments, not 20 day increments, especially as the world gets shorter in their formats and shorter in their inputs. I'm still a very long thinker and it gives me a huge advantage to see things in 20 year perspectives. That's awesome. I love that though. Pain is not a stop sign in David Milch's life. 
<laughs> it's a signal. <laughs> That's a quote of the day. Probably a quote of all my podcasts. I love that. All right. So your mission is to empower over 1 billion to be happy. So David Meltzer, are you happy? I'm on the pursuit of it. You, you, I, you know, every there, was time a I book. Say so, there was a book called the pursuit of happiness. Did you read that book? A friend of mine, Chris Gardner wrote it. He's a friend of mine and he's in the financial planning space. Obviously they made the movie with Will Smith uh, with him. I told him he got it backwards. I told him happiness is the pursuit. And yes. uh, I truly <laughs> believe that. And he laughs, but I truly believe that happiness is the pursuit. I also will tell you that I was born with a happy gene. I always think I'm happy. But until I look backwards at the year before and say, gosh, I'm so much happier now than I was. And that's a true uh, sign for me that I'm learning and living my life in the right way. Healthy and happy. There's four things uh, that I've learned. And I share this with my mom every day. because I think it's something that all parents really want to hear. And it's really helped my relationship with my mom. I tell my mom every day, minimum of a minute. I tell her, number one, I'm healthy. Number two, that I'm happy. Three, that I love her. And four, that I appreciate her, meaning she adds value to my life. If you tell your parents, no matter what age they are, that you're healthy and happy, appreciate them and love them, there's nothing else they really care about. They may give you a hard time about little stuff, but in the end, you will solidify your connection to the most important people in your life, your parents, uh, and give them the gratitude and appreciation for you that you have for them. All right. That's great to tell your parents. What do you tell your kids? Same thing. I also Same tell thing. my kids, I, but I tell them three things. All my kids. One, do your best. Two, learn a lesson. Three, have fun. So when they play a sport or go to school, I always ask them, did you do your best? Did you learn a lesson? What was it? And did you have fun? And those are the only three things that are really important to me. And I know that they'll be hyper successful if everything they do, they do their best. They learn some lessons and they have some fun along the way. Awesome. So tell me about the company that you have now. So you still have that company, right? Yeah. Sports One Marketing uh, mm -hmm. is the company, but I uh, stepped down as CEO in December uh, and focus on Dave Meltzer Enterprise. I'm still the co-founder of Sports One Marketing. Now that was a blessing as well. Talking about the law of attraction, because Sports One Marketing dealt with the biggest events in sports, Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, Masters, Kentucky Derby, Breeders' Cup, ESPYs, Emmys, Oscars, everything that's been canceled. So meanwhile, I stepped down in December and here now my speaking, coaching, TV show, especially the two minute drill took off. So I kind of, uh, once again, coincidences, the mathematical equation of luck took over. And, uh, you know, I would say that sports one marketing is maintaining itself. It's not the glowing, growing uh, company that I ran years past, um, but I don't think it would be if I was not the person who's there. It's just a matter of COVID and circumstance that, my luck had pivoted me into my own personal brand and media company. Mm. All right. So what's next for you? Is there anything next? I mean, you got TV. Always. <laughs> you're, you're, you're <laughs> well, we have new is... shows. Uh -huh. I got new shows coming out this year. I have season two of two minute drill. We'll have season seven of elevator pitch. And then I have a, the office hours that you came on uh, is yes. going to be a TV show in June. So okay. we'll have to have you back for that. And um, I'd love to be on the TV really show. Yeah. Yeah. So those TV shows are good. And then my coaching, I really, I do one on, so every Friday for two, over 20 years now, I do free training and it used to be out my office and I buy lunch for a hundred people every Friday. And I teach everything from sales training to pitch training, to ego training, to don't lie to yourself training. I got holiday training. Uh, but for 20 years, it's grown because of COVID because it went virtual. Uh, so we have over 20,000 people register every Friday it's the number one di downloaded podcast that I have. I have all the billionaires, celebrities, athletes, entertainers, people like you, uh, media people. But yet my training now is my number one downloaded podcast, even more than, you know, the wow. Danica Patrick's of the world or Ray Lewis's or, you know, Deepak Chopra, all the great people I've had on there, uh, which is really great. So I, it's always free. So just uh, David at dmelter.com, come register and join us. We'd love it. Sure. So you have training on holidays? <laughs> yeah, we have holiday training. I teach people about giving or thankfulness or Valentine's Day, probably love. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. So what advice do you have for business owners, entrepreneurs who are thinking about, you know, their business, especially during the pandemic and 
and um, growing their business and exiting their business, what advice do you have other than to call me? Yeah, no, call <laughs> Michelle for sure. Well, there's several things. One, your goal is to stay in business, right? Businesses right. grow, they accelerate. So you, number one is we want to make sure you're in business tomorrow. I've run hundreds of millions of dollars in businesses and I still wake up in the morning going, I got to guarantee I'm in business tomorrow because I know if I get at bat, whether it goes up or down, I'll eventually get to where I want to be. So number one, always stay in business. Two, make sure you take inventory of your skills, your knowledge of the what and who in your business and your desire daily mm -hmm. uh, and align those, see where they're synergistic or supplementary to what's doing well now, what's stable now, and what you may feel will be doing well in the future. Skills, knowledge, and desire in the supplementary synergistic respect of alignment with those industries. And if you're wondering where do I find that out, besides calling Michelle, you can look to the stock market and just take the top 50 performing stocks this year, take the top 50 stabilized stocks the last three years, stocks that haven't moved, and then pick out the industries, careers, jobs, within the context of what you think will be doing well in the future. For example, you know, refrigeration was an area I feel that in 2021 is going to be a really big industry. I think we have a shortage of the refrigeration units around the world that are going to be needed uh, for the vaccine. So I'll go ahead and align what skills does Dave Meltzer have, capabilities of who and what, and my desire of how I can make money off of what I think will be a growing industry for 2021. Those are just pragmatic examples of doing that. And as far as exiting, um, you know, I have an interesting perspective. Although I build businesses to exit, my perspective is I'm building the, what helps me exit quicker in a business is to build it as if I'm going to run it my entire life. I found that instead of attaching my emotions to an outcome that I'll, I'll exit in three years at a 10 multiple or whatever, for me, if you take the perspective of building the business, even though you want to exit it, you know, you might know you want to exit within three to five years. If you build it as if you're going to own it for your life, you'll be able to exit at a greater value and much quicker than if you build it to exit. I think as long as you build it to be sustainable and scalable and not dependent upon you. Correct. Because so many business owners build it as if they're never going to exit. And the problem with that concept is a business is a thousand percent dependent upon them. If I pull them out of the business, there is no business. So that, you know, that was my you, problem in sports one marketing. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were you the one in the living room negotiating with the athletes? You know, I was the one actually that looked over the guys and trained them and taught them and did all of the administrative stuff. And then would use me as the bug light with Lee. They bring the parents in you know, the young agents would take them out partying and buying them watches and all this stuff. And Lee and I would sit down with the parents and talk about how we would build a legacy, how we would teach them financial literacy, how we would take care of them, empower them, create a foundation of a cause or a purpose that they were interested in or have them be a part of that. Uh, so my, my job was a little bit more uh, calm, uh, although I had extraordinary access to extraordinary things. and still do. Uh, just blessed to be on the sidelines of the greatest events in, in, in sports and entertainment. And you're still involved in it, though, right? Kind of oh, from very. The back seat. Yeah. yeah so I you bet saw you the get video. some great stories. You could probably write a book on, on some of the stories. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, read, read my first book. There's some in there. So I have some fun <laughs> stories about the rappers like Little John and Hall of Famers and all types of fun stuff. Roberto Clemente Jr. There's some good stuff. So what advice do you have for, for people in sales or negotiations? Because I know you're like the negotiations expert. And, yeah, well, um, number ahead. one piece of advice. Sorry, yeah, that's one of my favorite questions because I think people ignore the most important things in sales and negotiation, which is credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's, you, everybody kind of gets emotional attachment, meaning people bound emotion for logical reasons, uh, but they lose their credibility. They'll oversell, back-end sell, lie, manipulate, or even cheat when they're in a situation. And the minute somebody gets that feeling, skepticism, you know, they start seeking and start not believing the quantitative value that you've articulated and you've ruined yourself on a pitch or in a negotiation. And so credibility to me is so important. I always joke around, but I say, if I could ever reach 100% credible, I could sell anything. I could tell Michelle right now, if I was 100% credible, hey, wire me a couple million, I'll give you a couple million back on you know, next Friday. And she would do it if I was 100% credible. So I think people discount credibility and yeah. they oversell back end sell. And so 
really think and look through what you're presenting with a fine tooth comb of illuminating the truth. I know even when we started the interview, you asked about my bankruptcy and because a lot of people would want to hide from that. Look, there's the Internet. I would be the dumbest guy in the world to, <laughs> to make myself seem like I'm some kind of financial genius. And then the first Google says Dave Meltzer lost over $100 million in a bankruptcy. Once I tell people up front that I'm a moron, that I lost $100 million, but learned some lessons from it. Would you like to learn with me and not have to pay that dummy tax? People admire me more. But if I yeah. hid it from them, the minute they find out, they're like, he's a scammer. You've he, lost you know, all credibility, right? And, they and you know all what? If you've lost $100 million in bankruptcy, guess what? You can make it again and again and again. You know, every time you I interview it. people, I'm always like, what's especially for, for salespeople, what's the most you've ever made? And if they never made six figures before or seven figures, I don't know if I want them on my team because if they never made it before, their financial thermostat is set very low. And I don't know if they can make it again unless they adjust their financial thermostat. Does that make sense? You, you nailed it. That's such an important <laughs> lesson to learn. Like I told my wife, I said, do you realize I made my first million dollars nine months out of law school. I had never had a real job, never had any connections. I had a hundred thousand dollars worth of loans. I said, what's going to stop me from making millions of dollars now? I've been like literally working and learning for the last 10 years successfully. I haven't lost my relationships. I've never, I've always been kind to my future self and done good deeds. I had to learn about giving and receiving a little bit. And, you know, cause I used to talk about negotiations. I used to give to receive. That's a terrible negotiation. It's a trade. Now I receive so I can give. I've shifted the paradigm of giving and receiving so that I feel very comfortable and worthy about receiving everything that I deserve. Mm. Some great, uh, some great principles. So power of intention by Wayne Dyer influenced you, right? I heard you talk about that in one of your interviews. Yeah, I read it every day. I read the course in miracles every day. I read think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill, which I know is one of your favorites as well. Uh, every single day I read experts from those books. I am a voracious audio book person. So uh, I have research time twice a day in my, I have two routines, a, a normal routine starting at 4 a.m., which really starts at 9 a.m. tonight. I have an unwinding routine. I always say my tomorrow starts today, but I have a very strict routine, but I also have an adaptable routine, but it always contains research time. And so that research time is audio books, podcasts, searching on Google, and it's, usually at least a minimum of three hours a day, an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half at night. Mm. Yeah. That was one of my next questions. What's your rituals? <laughs> yeah. So I wake up at four, meditate 20 minutes, 10 minutes, get ready. I spend a minimum of an hour a day on my health, a minimum of 30 minutes with my wife, a minimum of 30 minutes with my 10 year old, minimum of two minutes a day with my three teenage daughters. I asked for five. They gave me two and a minimum, like I said, of a, a minute a day with my mom. I believe two minutes a day is more powerful than two hours on a Saturday. So I'm very much into exponential uh, valuation of compound interest in even time. You know, so wow. I just don't zero out anything that I do by not doing it. I'm very consistent in the conscious continuum. Now, do you schedule this time or is it sporadic as your day goes? So I'm a, yeah, so I'm a student in my calendar. And so what that means is that I study what I have planned. I study what I don't have planned. And I study my sleep every day with a lens of productivity. How much value can I provide? A lens of accessibility. How accessible am I to others? And how am I accessing what I want? And then, of course, a lens of gratitude. I'm always seeking the light, the love, and the lessons, which gave us that great quote that pain to me is an indicator that I got lessons to learn. So once I find that pain and suffering, I go seek the lesson as fast as I can. And so the pain goes away. I love that. Is that your favorite quote? Because that was my next question. No, my favorite quote's uh, <laughs> from Lee Steinberg. It's be kind to your future self and do good deeds. I think if people were just kind and they took and really understood what I was saying, if you don't feel well, you're anxious, frustrated, angry, go do something good. You'll feel terrific. I promise you it's metaphysically, physically, quantum physically impossible not to feel good when you're doing good deeds. And kindness is the cure to all. And we need more kindness in the world. So that's my favorite quote. And also be more interested than interesting because that quote changed my life when I started being more interested than interesting. Yeah. And I think that helps build credibility too, because what you said was so important as far as building sales is credibility. I mean, salespeople, they always make it about their own agenda and they really don't build that credibility. And that's like you said, the most important key ingredients in sales. 
You're wonderful. So, Lightning Sports Rounds, and you're the sports guy. I want to know who's going to the Super Bowl. Oh, God. Well, Kansas City, obviously, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, they just um, beat us yesterday. <laughs> oh, my God. They're just so I'm in New tight. Orleans. Remember New Orleans Saints? I love – I'm a Saints fan, too. So, I'm, I'm putting the Saints <laughs> in there still. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on Taysom Hill or Drew Brees. I went to law school in New Orleans at Tulane. And uh, Jim Mora went to my college, was a friend of mine uh, way back when. So I became a Saints fan in the 90s when I was in law school. And I've been a Saints fan ever since. Oh, wow. Tulane. So you're right around the, the corner from me. I'm downtown on Poitras Street. Oh, and my I goodness. Have, I'll come visit you next time. Tulane. What's that? Yeah, I'll come visit you. My daughter's yeah. uh, just she's going to be there again. But she graduated uh, early and just now. And so she'll be back in New Orleans, though and working from there to walk in graduation in June. Awesome. So I'll send her down to your office. Yeah. So you better come visit me too. And hopefully COVID Heck will yeah. be over by then and we can go, we can go eat at Galaswas. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I'll eat anywhere. All right. So you say, so you say Kansas city, maybe the saints. Yeah. Kansas city and the saints. And I'm picking the saints to win. They're going to get to Mahomes. You're picking the saints to win. Really? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a homer. What can I tell you? <laughs> All right, let's put it out there. Picking the Saints to win. They I got robbed it. last year. It would have been a different story if they got robbed last year. I know. And the year yeah. before. <laughs> yeah. And the, oh. Oh two years God. in a row that I went to playoffs. And two years in a row, they got yeah. robbed. So we'll see. I'm like, you know, what's a common denominator here? Probably me going to the game. I'm still going to the game. <laughs> you sound like my son. He, he thinks the whole the whole NFL revolves around whether he's at the game or not or watching or not. I love it. He's 10, but I love it. <laughs> no, I would good. definitely be at the game. All right. So any last words of wisdom you want to leave our listeners? Well, I'll repeat the one that I gave before, but please, before I do that, everyone join me if you can on my free trainings or watch the replays. They're all featured on Spotify Entrepreneur, every platform. But most importantly, everyone, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. Thank you, Michelle, so much for having me. Thank you so much for for being here, David. And you know what? Thank you so much because you're on vacation with your wife at the beach. That's right. You came on my Exit Rich podcast, so thank you. And thanks to all of our listeners for listening to another episode of Exit Rich. Thanks for listening to the Exit Rich podcast. Don't forget to check out Michelle Seiler Tucker's Build to Sell Blueprint books and Exit Rich, along with more blogs, videos, and resources at ExitRichPodcast.com. Be sure to connect with Michelle on Facebook or LinkedIn and stay tuned for her next episode by subscribing in your favorite podcast player.